Welcome everyone to WOW Live, Word on Wednesday Live. Wow, let's uh, just jump right in to the, uh, tonight's lesson as I'm going to attempt to cover both Revelation 10 and 11, both chapters. Now, Revelation chapter 10 is a very short chapter. It's only 11 verses long, but some really fascinating things happen there. There's a fantastic scene at the beginning with this colossal, powerful angel. There are thunderous voices with messages that will remain secret. And the Apostle John, who has been passive up until this point in the book of Revelation, becomes more interactive as he's given a charge to prophesy even more in a very unique and interesting dietary sort of way. Anyhow, let's read the chapter and see what we have there. Uh, as soon as I can get it switched over to chapter 11 or chapter 10, verses 1 through 11, we're going to read the whole chapter here as we go into it. It begins, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. The angel, whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land, raised up his hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives for ever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be no delay, or del should be delay no longer, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. Then, so I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. So then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Chapter 10 starts off with another interesting person from the pages of Revelation. You know, you could do a character study of different persons and personalities uh, that you meet in the book of Revelation. It would be a fascinating study in and of itself. Verse 1, let's go back to the beginning of chapter 10, and where John says, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. So John records that he sees still another angel. He had seen a mighty angel before at the very beginning of Revelation chapter 5, if you remember. In verse 2, it says, Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? Now, the angel in Revelation 5 2 is strong. The angel in Revelation 10 verse 1 is mighty. The same Greek word is used in both verses. So that's why John says in chapter 10 that he sees still another angel. Two different entities, but the same type of angel. I believe I said that when we were studying chapter 5, that the angel Gabriel's name means one or a mighty one of God, a mighty one of God. 
Now, there's a Hebrew word, gibberim, that appears in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4. Now, based on the sound of, and especially the meaning of Gabriel's name, all right, Gabriel's name meaning mighty one of God, Based on the sound of his name, and especially the meaning of his name, see if you can guess which two words in Genesis 6-4 are translated from Gibberim. Let's take a look at the verse. There were giants in the earth on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Okay, do you have your choice made? Do you think you know which uh, two words here are translated from the Hebrew word gibberim? Well, if you said mighty men, okay, you give yourself a gold star, all right? Angelic be that's all you're going to get because I don't have anything for you. Angelic beings and human beings, okay, are two separate kinds of creatures. But apparently, both kinds can have individuals who are mighty. Interestingly enough, the, like the mighty angel in Revelation chapter 5, who asked about who is worthy to open the scroll, this mighty angel in Revelation 10 also is associated with the book. Kind of hard to see there, because this really isn't the best image. Uh, it was kind of hard to find a good image of, of this angel in chapter 10. But I have a circle there, and it's a little bit lighter than everything else around it. And in his hand, he is holding a scroll there. Now, some have said, therefore, that they believe that the little book that this angel in Revelation 10 is holding is the same scroll, the title deed to the earth that, has, that was in chapter 5, that has now been completely opened. All seven seals were, were opened. And since Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, is the, one who could, the only one who could open those seals, these folks further suggest that the mighty angel in Revelation chapter 10 is therefore Christ. But there's no good evidence to connect these two books. John Wolverd, commentator, writes this. Uh, in Revelation chapter 5, the Lamb has in his hands a seven-sealed book, which in successive chapters is unrolled, unfolded, the, unfolding rather the judgment symbolized by the seals. This book, in chapter 10, by contrast, is already open and specifically called a little book, referring to its size. Some have tried to connect this book with the scroll of chapters 4 through 6, but there is no clear identification which would make these the same. The name of the book itself is different. In chapter 5 and verse 1, the scroll is described by the Greek biblion. Whereas here, in chapter 10, the diminutive form is used. Bibliradion. Ridion. Bibliradion. I don't know. Sounds close to me. So the scroll and the little book do not have to be the same document. And as to whether this is actually Christ, uh, the Bible describes this Revelation chapter 10 being as another mighty angel. Now to me, that puts him on the same level of being as the angel in chapter 5, another of the same kind, okay? In chapter 5, the mighty angel and the lion of the tribe of Judah clearly are separate uh, beings, okay? And the word another angel here implies that there are more than just one kind of angel, or one angel of that kind, I should say. Jesus Christ is God the Son. He is the only begotten Son of God. He is therefore separate from all of the creation. He is unique from any angelic beings. I cannot believe, therefore, that Revelation 10's angel is Jesus. So if you hear that you, and somebody tells you that, you can tell them, well, Pastor Brian says that you're wrong. You know, uh, Of course, I'll deny it if they come after me after that. Um, I don't know. Anyway, this mighty angel's uh, description seems indicative of judgment. Uh, seven thunderings accompany him as he roars with a loud voice, as a lion might roar. Now, interestingly enough, research has shown that the roars of these big cats, especially the tiger's roar, 
carry frequencies that are below the range of human hearing. Such sound is called infrasound. We can't hear it. Uh, it's, it's too low for us to hear. The frequencies are too low. But nonetheless, there's a way in which we can feel it, you see. Low frequencies, for one thing, they carry farther than do the higher frequencies. And even though we can't hear them, that we can feel them, in, apparently, in our bodies. And, and infrasound frequencies can therefore have this fear-inducing and paralyzing effect. It's one of the things that helps the tiger catch his prey without having to do a lot of running. They freeze when he roars like that. All of which makes me wonder if some of the loud sounds that we read about in Revelation carry that same sort of impact. I just was thinking about this because there's so much uh, going on. It's been catching my eye this time through Revelation about all the sounds and all the noise that's going on in heaven. And it just made me wonder if some of that uh, carries beyond just what is heard with your ears. So anyhow, this mighty angel, he's clothed with a cloud. He has fiery feet, one on land, one on the sea indicating that the judgments that are yet to come are to come upon the entire earth. Now, here is where a mystery lies. Verse 4, Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, says John, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. Okay. In the book of Revelation, we know that judgment comes from the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials, which we'll get into a little bit later in the book, or seven bowls, it's sometimes called. Judgment comes from each of those. But we do not know what comes from the seven thunders, for John is not permitted to write them down. You could almost speculate that it's probably judgment of some kind too, but we just don't know. And the, the mighty angel come down from heaven, all right, now stands astride the earth and the sea. Take note of the lo locations there, heaven, earth, and sea, because he raises his right hand, and, in, and he swears, I assume it's his right hand, uh, because that's usually what you do when you are swearing or swearing in or whatever. He swears by the eternal God, it says in the passage, who created heaven and earth and sea and all that dwells in them, that judgment will no longer delay. Okay, God owns heaven. He created it. He, he created earth. He owns that. He owns the sea. Okay, and this angel is swearing by, all th by, by God, by the eternal God, in all three domains. Judgment is no longer going to delay. Heavenly beings, meaning fallen heavenly creatures, are also going to be judged. The seventh trumpet is about to sound, the last of the trumpets. And when that seventh angel is about to sound that seventh trumpet, the mystery of God, he says, will be finished, just as he had declared to his servants the prophets. Now, as we get into this, John becomes more active himself. Then the voice, verse 8 and 9, verses 8 and 9, then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. I, considering what that angel looked like, I think I might have said please. <laughs> you know, but he doesn't. He just says, Give, give me the little book. And, and he said to me, the angel said to John, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter uh, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. It'll taste really sweet, John, but uh, it, it's going to make you sick to your stomach. Did you ever eat anything like that? <laughs> Tasted good in your mouth. The taste buds were rejoicing, but boy, when it got to the stomach acids and everything else, it started to churn or something. I seem to recall uh, eating good-tasting food that gave me indigestion, all right? However, I do not recall ever eating a book or a scroll or even a, like a postage stamp, you know. I, I, I've heard of Reader's Digest, all right, but I think trying to digest a book, <laughs> that might be rather binding. Yeah, I went there. 
Well, anyway, there is, of course, an obvious symbolism here of internalizing the Word of God, chewing on it, meditating on it, mulling it over in your mind, pondering on it. And, and just like nutritious food, all of it with the intention of making the message of God's Word to be part of you especially true for the messenger of his word. The, the last two verses of Revelation chapter 10, verses uh, uh, 10 and 11, say this. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Don't let that word just sit in your stomach and give you indigestion, John. Don't let it sit there and burn up inside of you, man. Preach it. Proclaim it. There is much left to prophesy here. And all of that now moves us into Revelation chapter 11. Now, uh, there, as a little background commentary, uh, in order here uh, that I need to go over with you to, to give some context for where we are right now in the book of Revelation, okay? Um, basically, the events from Revelation chapter 1 through chapter 9, they have been chronological. They've been in order, one after the other, okay? Christ appears to John on the island of Patmos at the beginning of the book. Christ writes seven letters to the seven churches. And John takes those as dictation and distributes those letters. Then after that, John is taken into heaven. All right. Christ takes the seven-sealed scroll from his father's hand so John can witness that in heaven. And then he proceeds to open those seals of judgment, one seal at a time. All of this proceeds chronologically, right? Then in chapter 10, we hit what can be called a parenthetical section, okay? We're in a sort of pause between the sixth trumpet and the actual implementation of what this seventh trumpet is going to announce. There's a pause here, and this parenthetical pause extends all the way through chapter 14, Begins chapter 10 that we've just covered and on through 14. Chapters 15 and 16 will then mark the seven vials, that's V-I-A-L-S, or the seven bowl judgments, which the seventh trumpet announced. The important point for us is, as we are studying this, is to remember that we don't take chapters 10 through 14 as a chronology. They're not in chronological order. They're sort of scattered, and we'll have a good sense of that in chapter 12, which we get to next week. The things happening here in these chapters, they're just as real, and they are just as significant as the other things that we have seen in Revelation. We simply cannot interpret them as being in in chronological order, okay? For example, what we're about to see in Revelation 11 uh, seems to fit best in the second half of the seven-year-long tribulation, the last three and a half years. That second half is better known as the time of the great tribulation, a tremendous ramping up of the judgment against the evil of the world right before Christ himself returns. So let's take a look now at chapter 11. Let me call it up here for us. Verses 1 and 2, starting there. John says, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So, basically, John, he has been given this message that he has to prophesy, because he took in that, that word in chapter 10. And now here in 11, he's given this measuring rod. And he is com commanded 
to measure the temple. Now, this measuring rod was a bamboo-like cane that, that grew along the banks of the, the River Jordan. Why was John told to me measure the temple area? Well, both John MacArthur and John Walvoord agree that this is symbolic of God's ownership. It's saying, God is saying, this is my territory, my holy place and my holy of holies. All right. He's taking into account uh, measuring what it is that he owns. He's, he's marking out his claim, okay? Uh, establishing boundaries, a border surrounding the Holy of Holies and the holy place. The altar that's mentioned here likely is the altar of incense that we've already seen. So this area to be measured is likely less than the entire temple complex. You get a sense of it there. Uh, just the, the building in the back that you see in this image, uh, kind of that mausoleum looking structure back there. That's the place where John is, is measuring. Anything outside of that, those exterior walls, and then the wider uh, court outside of the, the, those walls, and then that portico, those, those pillars around the outside of the, ex, the most exterior wall. Okay, that's all, he's not measuring any of that. Okay, all right, uh, establishing boundaries. All right, um, the holy of holies and the holy place where the altar of incense is. Now, just checking this out from a different viewpoint. We can see uh, this from what it says in verse 2. Uh, the Lord t uh, tells John, don't measure the court area outside of the temple building itself. So here we are using Herod's temple as an example of this. You can see here where the priest court is. If you look at the, the building in the back again, you'll see there's a cutaway to tell you a little bit about the inside on this chart, which we don't have the whole chart, but you got one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven in there marking different things, and then there's a, a key off to the side somewhere that tells you what those things are. So that's, that's all inside. That's where John is measuring, okay, in there and in the Holy of Holies in the very back. But outside, you see the priest's court there, the priest's courtyard inside that yellow oval, all right? Uh, that he's not measuring. And then you move out a little further, there's the women's courtyard. And then outside of the wall is the Gentile court for non-Jewish people, okay? The only area John is taking into account or measuring is what is inside of the building because the Gentiles have taken over the rest, okay? Revelation 11.2 says that for 42 months or three and a half years, all right, the Gentiles will overrun the court areas outside the temple building, including the priests, the women's, and the Gentiles' courts. Now, 42 months is half of an 84-month long period, right? 242s is, 80, 242s is 84, uh, or seven years, okay? Seven years, 84 months is seven years. The seven years of the tribulation period. You may recall that when the seven-year tribulation period is also known as Daniel's 70th week, which we studied when we looked at Daniel 9 and verse 27. Let's take a look at that right now. Daniel 9.27, with some explanatory notes, okay? Uh, then he, meaning the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many. And that would be Israel, Daniel's people. That's what this is all about. The seven years is about, this, this 70th week of Daniel is all about Israel, all right? And for one week, which is the 70th week of this Daniel 9 prophecy, all right? Each one of the weeks there is a seven-year-long week, so to speak. Okay, but in the middle of the week, okay, dead center, middle of the week, three and a half years into the tribulation time, okay, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. That would be the Antichrist. He will stop worship in the temple. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. Okay, the abomination of desolation, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So all things finally consumed and brought to an end, okay? This is a good place to remind you of what Jesus said about Daniel's prophecy here in Daniel 9, 27. Therefore, Jesus said, when you see 
the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. That's where the abomination itself will actually stand. And then Matthew adds, whoever reads this, let him understand. Be clear what you're, you're, you're getting here. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So, John doesn't measure the courts as they have been overrun by Gentiles. He measures the holy of holies in the holy place. But look, says Jesus, according to Daniel, in the middle of the seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist will stop worship in the holy place with this abomination of desolation. Something abominable is going to be placed in the temple. Any wicked thing brought into the holy place would be an abomination. The Apostle Paul talks about this very same thing. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, the son of destruction. We talked about that earlier. That's the Apollyon word there, uh, translated as perdition, the Greek word being Apollyon. And it means destruction, the destroyer, the son of, of destruction who opposes and he exalts himself above all that is called God. He opposes all that's called God and he exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So, the Antichrist comes into the temple of God, demands to be worshipped as God. This, friends, is Daniel's abomination of desolation. Paul talks about it. Jesus talks about it. When that happens, Jesus says that the great tribulation will begin. Nothing has ever happened like it before or will happen after. It's terrible. And the great tribulation will be the second half of the tribulation, the final three and a half years before Jesus returns. Okay, and so that's what's talked about here in chapter 11, because now we find out the Lord is going to send out witnesses into that final three and a half year long period. Verses three through six, two witnesses. God says, I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These two men have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Okay, so the 1,260 days is also 42 months long, or three and a half years years. Uh, from the lesson of a few weeks ago on the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, uh, you may recall uh, that a Jewish year is 360 days long. Even if you don't recall it, it's true. It is. A Jewish year for them was 360 days long. So seven years times 360 days per year equals 2,520 days. And half of 2,520 days is 1,260 days, exactly what we saw here in Daniel 11. So we see that there will be two witnesses who prophesy during the last half of the tribulation, during that tribulation, great tribulation period, the final three and a half years, 1,260 days. The point of this is, that God will have a witness of himself present and very active during that last half of the tribulation. God always sends out his word to let people know what's going on. Two men are going to give regular testimony of the one true God to all of the world. Right before he ascended back to the Father, Jesus Christ told his disciples in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, 
And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I think that a God-sent witness is quite obviously a person who is called to testify about God's message to people in that time and in that place. In other words, someone specifically is called to testify whatever God's message is, is to those people in their time and in their place. Uh, God's truth never changes, but he does change how he deals with men throughout time, Dif uh, different time, different ways with different people in different times. And so his message changes in that sense to meet what's going on so that they are aware of what he's doing. That's the same thing that is happening here. These two witnesses are talking about uh, the, the, the coming of the Messiah. Whatever message might be of the time, that's what's being taught. And during the last half of this, God sends two witnesses in this great tribulation time. Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 15 says this, one witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. So there can't be any judgment on the basis of one witness. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. Then judgment can come upon the one who has sinned, you see. There's judgment inherent in this thing. So these two men are dressed in sackcloth, all right? Sackcloth is a lowly garment worn in times of mourning and repentance. Now, this message is for people to repent. Repent because the Messiah is coming. Change now. Time is running out. All right? Now's the day to get yourself straightened up. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the message they're going to be giving. The kingdom is about ready to begin. So that's the message they're going to be giving to the people there. When he comes, he's setting up his kingdom, right? Now, if that message, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, if that message sounds familiar to you, it is the message that was preached by two other witnesses in the New Testament. John the Baptist and Jesus himself both preached that message when Jesus came to offer his kingdom the first time, but was rejected, you see. But the, the kingdom of heaven is at the door. It's near. It's at hand. So these two witnesses in the latter part of the tribulation, they have great power to protect their witness. All right? If anyone tries to kill them, fire is going to come out of their mouths uh, to, to kill that person. The witnesses can stop rain from coming. They can turn water to blood, it says in the text. And they can strike the earth with all kinds of plagues, all at their own discretion when they decide. The two witnesses are described metaphorically as two olive trees. Let's take a look at the image that we have here. Uh, that's what I've been emphasizing here or showing to you. Uh, two olive trees and two lampstands. You can see the lampstands at the top of each olive tree. Um, we can readily get the idea, of course, that, that those lampstands are giving off light and witness giving off light, that sort of makes sense. You're the light of the world and so forth. But what about those olive trees? What's going on with them? Commentator Damon R. Duck gives the, the, uh, a good answer to that question. He says, each witness is represented by one olive tree and one lampstand. It takes two symbols to represent one person, because two different things are happening here. To understand this passage, we need to know what those symbols mean. The answer to the olive trees is found in Zechariah 4, verses 3 through 6. There are two olive trees that stand by a lampstand and provide oil to the lampstand. This oil represents the Holy Spirit. The two witnesses will be olive trees because they will be filled with the Holy Spirit, okay, olive oil, okay. Zechariah 4, 11 to 14 explains what the lampstands represent. The lampstands hold pots of burning oil that provide light. The two witnesses will be lampstands because they will provide light to a dark world. Now, he says, combine the two sim symbols and think about it. Each witness will be one olive tree filled with the Holy Spirit and one lampstand giving off 
the light of God. They will be two witnesses filled with the Holy Spirit, counteracting the forces of darkness in the world. What a powerful image. Because of the abomination of desolation in the temple and the onset of this great tribulation, you see, the Jews have now become the target of the Antichrist. Remember, Jesus had told his disciples that when that abomination of desolation found in Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, when that appeared in the temple, that abomination in the temple, the Antichrist in the temple declaring himself to be God and demanding to be worshipped as God, those who are living in Judea at the time, in the area around the temple, Jesus says, get out. You need to flee. When you see that, get out of town. Don't go back for anything. Don't stop for anything. If you're pregnant or you have children, woe to you because it's going to slow you down. Hence the two witnesses, they're dressed in these mourning clothes, they are mourning Israel, but at the same time, they give off light as witness to God that God is doing something, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit for service to proclaim what's going on. So who are these two men, these two witnesses? Though we can't be certain at all, a clue to their identity might reside in reviewing the other supernatural abilities that they are, uh, were told that they will exhibit during the Great Tribulation. And we find that information in Revelation 11, verse 6. These two have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Now you think about this, Elijah is the one prophet in the Old Testament who shuts off rain in Israel. All right, Moses was used by God to turn the waters of Egypt into blood, and also he was used by God to bring upon Egypt all manner of plagues. Both Elijah and Moses also have mysterious ends to their earthly existences. Their time on earth ends strangely in both cases. Here's Deuteronomy 34, verses 5 through 7. I see that uh, the, the Franciscan custody of the Holy Land, Mount Nebo Memorial of Moses there, uh, Christian holy place, that they have a marker there on Mount Nebo. So, Here's what Deuteronomy 34 says about Moses and his death. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. Okay, And God, he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor. Let's see here. But no one knows his grave to this day. So that marker probably doesn't mean much other than just somewhere in the general vicinity at a point near here that we don't know whatever no one knows where his grave is to this day Moses was 120 years old when he died his eyes were not dim nor his natural vigor diminished now get that Moses was in good shape when he died it's not like he had some disease that was claiming him he didn't die of natural causes, okay? He died according to the word of the Lord. That's what the verses are telling us there. And then the Lord himself took care of burying Moses in a hidden and unmarked grave. No one knew where he was buried. Boy, you think, that doesn't sound right. That's not honoring him like we ought to, etc., etc., etc. There's a curious verse in the little book of Jude that precedes the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Jude's a really cool book in a lot of ways. Check this out, Jude 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So, see, Michael says, you know, let the Lord rebuke Satan. I'm not going to do it, okay? But what's really interesting here is they're disputing over the body of Moses. No one knows where it's buried, right? 
The account that Jude is talking about here isn't found in the Old Testament. Okay, it comes from a writing uh, that Jude would have been familiar with probably from about the 2nd or 3rd century BC, a writing that's known as the Assumption of Moses. Okay, and I don't think it means that Moses is assuming things in his mind or something. Uh, this is the assumption of Moses' body, basically. Okay, uh, it, it also purportedly records Moses' last words right before God takes him. Now, whether it really did, I, I don't know. But because this account of the devil and Michael the archangel disputing over Moses' body does appear in the Holy Spirit-inspired New Testament, all right, I believe the event, that event part of it, actually occurred. There was some kind of dispute in the angelic realms over the body of Moses. Well, why would that happen? Well, it's speculated that Satan may have wanted to know the location of Moses' grave for the purpose of directing people to having that site venerated by the Hebrews, thus taking their attention off of Yahweh. See, there are people today who practically worship saints, okay? And it can take attention off of Christ as they give uh, much uh, more attention to certain people. And boy, that can happen in a church anywhere. You start following a pastor or following a particular teacher or a guy on TV or whatever it is, some evangelist or something, and you're getting your attention taken off Christ and you're focusing on that person. Careful with that. It may not be the Lord behind that directing you to do that. Probably isn't. Okay? I'm being soft here. Okay? Elijah, of course, he also had a mysterious means of departing this life. Uh, Elijah didn't experience death. Let's take a look at uh, his uh, circumstance here. 2 Kings 2.11 Then it happened as Elijah and Elisha, that's the they there, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire. This is a heavenly thing. And separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah did not experience death. He was translated alive directly into heaven. So you see, there is mystery surrounding the ends of both Moses and Elijah as far as the ends of their earthly existences. Curiously, both Moses and Elijah make an appearance together back on earth during the time of Christ. This is Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. He was glorified in their presence, right? His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. And behold, hey, get this, in other words, pay attention to this, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. That's interesting. Now, also in Matthew chapter 17, a little later on, we read of how Elijah is to appear right before the Messiah comes. They're coming down the mountain now, Matthew 17, verses 9 to 13. Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Watch television. Now, wait a minute. That's not what it says. <laughs> You've got you to read carefully when you read the Bible. Saying to them, Tell the vision to no one. Don't tell anybody about what you just saw until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And this is what the Jews believe, see? Okay. Um, and Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. And then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Wow. John the Baptist 
came typifying Elijah in uh, the Messiah before the Messiah's first advent, before his first coming. He's 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 a type of Elijah. He comes in the spirit and the power of Elijah. It seems reasonable if Elijah comes before, uh, in a sense, before the Messiah's first advent, that Elijah would also then, in a sense, appear before the Messiah comes again. And we, because this is a Jewish thing, this is the, the time of the tribulation, to, to say that Elijah is here, that means the Messiah really is coming, and we have this guy stop in the rain, wow, that's Elijah, you know, ding, ding, they would remember, right? And we have these two witnesses, the very end of the tribulation, right before Jesus the Messiah comes a second time. Elijah could easily be one of those witness, witnesses, Moses qualifying as the other witnesses with the plagues and the water turned to blood. But it doesn't have to be that way. And I think that's important, too. We don't want to be dogmatic about this. A lot of evidence. It, it wouldn't surprise me at all, at all if it was them. However, John Walford says this. It seems far preferable to regard these two witnesses as two prophets who will be raised up from among those who turn to Christ in the time following the rapture. Okay? So... They're going to rise up from among those people, maybe out of the 144,000 or something. I don't know. But are they in the spirit and power of Elijah, as John the Baptist was? Are they in the spirit and power of Moses? Yeah, I, you know, it seems very interesting to me. All, all, all very fascinating stuff. Now, these two witnesses, they're dressed like John the Baptist, right? They are mourning for Israel's time of trouble, Jacob's time of trouble. And they give witness to the Lord during the great tribulation. They are calling for repentance. And because of this, they are hated by the whole world, especially by the Antichrist. But they are kept unharmed for the duration of their mission, for the three and a half years, 1,260 days, 42 months. And they wreak havoc upon the planet, halting rain, bringing plagues, uh, killing any opposition that comes in their way by the breath of their mouth, and, 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 and bringing plagues as often as they choose to do so. And then something happens. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days, and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Hmm. Now verse 7 speaks of the beast who ascended out of the bottomless pit. Now, we met this beast from the bottomless pit, from the abyss, before. His name is Abaddon, and in the Greek, his name is Apollyon. The beast from the bottomless pit, Apollyon, the destroyer from the abyss, he is the Antichrist, empowered by Satan. And the Antichrist in the second half of the tribulation sets his guns on Israel and especially on these two witnesses sent to, to proclaim the coming of the Messiah uh, to Israel to get people to repent and to believe that their Messiah is coming. Now the time of their testimony is complete and thus the Antichrist is permitted to kill them that the bodies of these two witnesses, ambassadors of God in a very true sense, could remain lying in the streets of Jerusalem, where they presumably will die, ought not stretch our credulity. This is not unbelievable at all. In our time, this kind of occurrence could have taken place, or could take place. And in some cases, it's very similar things have happened, where uh, Americans on foreign so soil have been killed and then marched out into the streets with the people, the dead bodies being carried out. And the whole world could watch it. 
in, in, in any number of ways today, the peoples, the tongues, and the nations, all could see it in all kinds of ways. That the bodies of these men are not buried shows the level of hatred and disrespect that the world at the time will have for them. And they'll be celebrating, right? Um, their dead bodies, it says, will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and in Egypt, where our Lord uh, also was crucified, okay? So, uh, as I read this verse, the only identifier I can readily note indicating that this city is Jerusalem is where John says, where our Lord was crucified. All right, that clinches it. The title Great City is a clue. Uh, Great City often refers to Jerusalem in the Bible. Uh, but spiritually calling Jerusalem Sodom and Egypt, that kind of throws me. I'd have to know it's Jerusalem and then speculate on why would it be called Sodom, uh, a pit of sin, and why would it be called Egypt, also equated with sin in the Bible. Uh, so there's much sin there, and our Lord was crucified there. Uh, perhaps it is the way they treated him that uh, John is referring to here. Anyway, I needed those words where our Lord was crucified to help me identify this as Jerusalem. Sodom and Egypt represent sin and wickedness, worthy of judgment, worthy of plagues. Recall as well at this time that the Gentiles have overrun the city. That's what John was told when he was set out to measure, right? The political stability of Jerusalem in our own day is tenuous at best. Anyone could overrun the city at any given time. Things could change on a dime, right? And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them being dead, make merry, and send gifts to one another because the two prophets who tormented those uh, of these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. All right, those who dwell on the earth, used twice there and elsewhere in, in, in Revelation. Those who dwell on the earth, that phrase, they are those whose names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life. All right, the phrase refers to those, therefore, who are lost, who are left behind after the rapture of the church. That could happen. Think about it. Do you know Christ? Do you know him as Savior and Lord of your life? It's important to know that. He's coming. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not so much that these ones on the earth, those who dwell on the earth, it's not so much that they dwell on planet earth or they live here. No, these earth dwellers are those who are of the world system. Okay, because they don't have that spiritual connection to God the Father through Christ the Son, they are caught up then in the world system run by Satan. All right, those who are of the world system, therefore, are the ones who make merry, are the ones who rejoice when the two prophets who had tormented them for the last three and a half years of the tribulation, uh, they're, they're glad that they're dead. And they all celebrate by giving gifts to one another, just like it's Christmas time. It's almost a mockery of the birth of Christ, that these servants of Christ would be found dead, put to death by the Antichrist. But things begin to change, and the time for making merry uh, quickly comes to an end. Verses 11 through 14 of chapter 11. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them, probably dropped their presence in the mud, okay? And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. See, that's where I think that, that infrasound, uh, fear-inducing kind of shudder probably takes place for these people when they hear that voice. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. They saw this happen. And there's witnesses to these witnesses being taken away. In the same hour, same time that that happened, judgment. There was a great earthquake. A tenth of the city fell. And in the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed. And the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Sounds like some people in uh, Judaism are coming to recognize 
Our Messiah is about to get here. That was Elijah. I told you it was, you know, that kind of thing. Very fascinating. And then the second woe is past. Remember, there were three woes. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. It's going to happen quickly. In a remarkable final testimony to those who dwell on the earth, the Lord raises up these two witnesses from the dead after they'd been dead for three and a half days, very similar to the time of Christ in the tomb. And they ascend into heaven while the whole world watches. Understandably, this causes great fear. Jerusalem experiences this big earthquake, killing 7,000 people. To close out this chapter for this evening, here is the rest of chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, you might recognize this, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. More noise in heaven. Wow. The temple on earth in Jerusalem may be desecrated by the abomination of desolation brought about by Satan through his Antichrist. Okay, that temple is done. But the temple of God in heaven demonstrates the righteousness of God. The appearance of the ark of God's covenant compels us to understand God still has Israel as the apple of his eye. He is not through with the nation of Israel, folks. Remember, this seven-year tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble, Israel's trouble. It is meant for Israel to get them to acknowledge the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. The seventh trumpet will ultimately result in seven bowl judgments or vile judgments upon the earth as things come to an end. Seven seals, seven trumpets, and then finally seven bowls of judgment. But we will not see the first bowl poured out until we get to Revelation chapter 16. Remember that parenthetical section that we're in now. Chapters 12, 13, and 14 will describe things that are concurrent throughout the seven-year tribulation on earth, or they have a part to do with some of it. It is like God is telling us, hey, here also are some things that will be happening as the end of the age draws near. So I certainly hope that you will be able to join us next week as we get into chapter 12. Very fascinating, very interesting chapter indeed. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon.